Uh, welcome everybody to our uh, CMBC lecture from uh, Professor Alex Bentley. Uh, my name is Dietrich Stout. I'm the, uh, the associate director of the center. Uh, Lynn Nygaard is the director, is here today uh, as well. And uh, you may already be familiar with our center. We uh, basically promote uh, interdisciplinary research at the intersection of mind, brain, and culture. Uh, and one of the things that we do is have these uh, uh, lecture series, and uh, we also sponsor things like uh, uh, lunches. Um, there's a uh, graduate certificate program that you should look into if you think you might be interested in the kinds of uh, work that we promote. Um, and so that's us, and we're very, we're very pleased today to have uh, Alex Bentley joining us, who uh, really does the, the kind of uh, interdisciplinary research that we're, we're seeking to, to promote. Um, he's joining us today from uh, the University of Tennessee, uh, Knoxville. Um, he's been there since uh, 2017. I think he was the, uh, the head of the Department of Anthropology for three years, but probably, thankfully, has uh, rotated out of that position uh, now. Um, he actually he got his PhD in anthropology from the University of Wisconsin, but he also has uh, other degrees of training at various levels in archaeology, geochemistry, and physics. Uh, so he's very interdisciplinary. Uh, prior to moving to Knoxville, he spent uh, 14 years at uh, various British universities, including uh, Bristol, Durham, and UCL. Uh, so his research, which we'll hear about today, uh, focuses on interdisciplinary approaches to understanding culture change. Uh, from the ancient past right up to the present day. Uh, and his methods uh, range from uh, things like the analysis of isotopes and archaeological skeletal material uh, in order to reveal patterns of kinship, inequality, uh, migration, and culture change, on up to computational social science. And if, if you don't know what that is, I think that's what he'll be talking about today. Uh, so I'll let, you, let him fill, uh, uh, fill you in on that. Um, uh, of course, Alex has uh, numerous publications in peer-reviewed journals like uh, Nature, Human Behavior, uh, Journal of Archaeological Science, Behavioral and Brain Sciences, and he also has a couple of recent books that you might want to check out. Uh, the Acceleration of Culture Change from Ancestors to Algorithms uh, and the Importance of Small Decisions, uh, both of these from mm -hmm. MIT Press. Uh, so with that, uh, if you join me in uh, giving a warm welcome to Professor Alex Bentley. Um, yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I hope I can visit your campus some other time. I was looking forward to the trip. But, um, and because this is such an interdisciplinary group, I'm, the, the nature of my talk is going to be sort of, is very broad brush. Uh, I'll show the results of studies that we've done, and, um, but nothing in great detail. I'm not gonna lay out for you experimental plan or you know, methods and results. Um, because I, I want to share kind of an idea that I've been thinking about a lot since uh, writing this book in 2017, um, which is that, you know, when, when, you, when, when you work across archaeology and then also look at contemporary culture change and even study uh, social media, the thing that struck me is just the, uh, the perception of change in culture very fast, but one which may be uh, a, really a transition from our behaviors being something learned from one generation to the next um, for very long periods of time versus things that we respond to globally, you know, from yesterday. Um, and I, I consider it a difference between long and, and narrow kinds of uh, learning of, of behaviors, narrow meaning through long time periods, and short and shallow where you know, we're picking up on things just from yesterday that might have happened anywhere in the world and trying to think through what might be the implications of that for the, excuse me. Um, and uh, so at the center of all this is a few questions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of lay out a few theoretical questions at first and then go through a couple of ca uh, kind of examples one being obesity and the other being uh, COVID-19. <clears throat> so there'll be contemporary examples. But, um, you know, one of the things that when you work in an interdisciplinary environment, you realize we don't often, in psychology and anthropology, we may not agree on 
or economics. We not we may not in, uh, it agree on something as fundamental to, as uh, how people make decisions. So something when I when I lived in England and would get uh, there was a national health service, uh, you know, for uh, basically uh, national health insurance. I'd get a leaflet in in my mailbox that something like better information means better care. And there's an assumption there in the public health sector that if you're well informed, you'll make a rational choice about what to do. You make a cost benefit decision. Uh, but in the last 10 years of uh, even in economics now, like Robert Schiller and uh, won the Nobel Prize in 2013 is talking about, well, what if you don't have time to gather the information and make any, and you make your decision based on nothing more than hearsay and emotions. And that picture there is me years ago when my uh, son was a little baby and we we're in REI. And I'm, um, I, I asked my wife to pose that picture because it's an example of what I call choice, you know, frustration. I, I just want an insulated coffee mug. I don't need to choose between 50 different varieties. I, I don't have any idea what the different costs and benefits of them are. Um, okay. And uh, I used to work in circles with uh, advertisers and marketers. And so there would often be the idea since, especially since Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Tipping Point 20 years ago, that um, uh, people make decisions uh, through social influence. And we, there are certain people with much more social influence than others. And they might be broadcast. It's a sort of a broadcast model like you see on the left. Or it might be um, the model like the study like you see on the right, which is uh, uh, a, a recent study that is claiming that the main influencer of um, misinformation about COVID-19 has been President Trump. Now, this is a published study. I'm not taking a position on it. But um, the reason I show it here is that it's, a, it's an excellent example of the influencer idea that there, there are there are singular people who have the resources or uh, in Joan Henrik's terms, you know, have, have, a, have a lot of prestige or fame um, and, and, and uh, exert a lot of influence. So if you wanna change people's opinions or make decisions, you have to do it through them. But then there's a kind of a different approach, one adopted by Duncan Watts, for example, or um, in this, in the kinds of network approaches to public health like uh, by Christakis and, and Fowler. And this is from their pretty famous paper now from 2007, where they argued that if we draw a network of people from a, the Framlington Heart, um, a Framlington database in uh, the Boston area of, of physicians uh, records, and we look at people as a, as a social network and how they're related, friends and family, and whether or not they're obese or not obese, uh, female or male, that we can see a correspondence of a, a network pattern, a clustering of obesity, such that uh, obesity, that is a BMI over 30, is uh, almost 60% more likely if your friend is obese. And th there's been a big debate over this model, whether it shows influence or homophily like associating with like, but my point is that it's not a it's not a highly centralized network where one person is influencing everybody else. It's it's highly dispersed, and that's been a substantial debate in the kind of literature that I follow. You know, um, do, you know, do we make decisions are in, in terms of social influence and networks? Do they do they spring from from hubs and out to the spokes, or are they diffused and it, it, the next idea could come from anyone, or the the next influence could be your neighbor? Um, and another question just to put out into the, uh, you know, into your thought for the moment is if um, what happens now in the, in the modern era where uh, in the social media era where we're all aware of the sorting and the echo chambers and so on and the upper right is an example of a, a network of uh, Russian uh, Twitter accounts that we just my group and I just visualized this morning. Uh, these are from tweet accounts in Belarus, tweeting stuff about elections um, and protests there in Belarus. Um, but the lower right is a network of uh, published, of, of social media interaction published by Neil Johnson's group that's kind of worrying that show that the doctors in blue and anti-vax sites in red 
and then everybody else in green, just sort of regular people accounts. And the concern here is that the anti-vax sites are more well mixed with the most of the population than the doctors who are espousing, you know, wear masks and uh, get your vas vaccine and so on. That there's a there's a growing distance between the experts and the audience that they're trying to reach. Um, and on the left, I I use that uh, image there of just a, a little bit of a Twitter thread to just uh, make the remark that, and again, recalling Joe Henrik, who used to be at Emory uh, many years ago, that, uh, you know, what is it we attend to when we decide to listen to someone? Um, and one of the things that's become a very prominent um, statistic or aspect of, of communication is how popular is something, how many retweets or likes. But this is totally, you know, this is totally unprecedented in human evolution or human history that we that we're aware precisely of how many times somebody has been listened to or deferred to or, or just without without any reference to um, the uh, the content of what he or she is saying. And that's why I chose this thread as well. Christian, are you there? How about now? There's nothing. There is no cost, in my opinion. There's no really appreciable cost or benefit to that that message. It's not a, some kind of life saving. Um, Announcement, um, and so I think with this group um, that would will be aware at least you know in anthropology and in, in, in my corner of anthropology we think about the brain as being fundamentally social. It, um, that uh, there's an old paper by Lieberman and Eisenberger that nice um, uh, diagram there on the lower left that shows that you know, and I know there are neuroscientists and psychologists in the audience here, but. Um, for me, I interpret it as you know, you know the um, regions of the brain that that um, that that we're susceptible to uh, physical pains and pleasures are are close to the same uh, regions of the brain that give us social rewards and social exclusion, feelings of social exclusion, uh, and a lot of re a lot of interesting recent re recent research on. Um, the uh, coordination of time series between regions of the brain and, and just to cut a long story short for now, say, showing that um, uh, you know, coordinated time series between two regions of the brain or what may, may be slightly offset uh, are especially coordinated among, uh, among, uh, uh, among friends. Thank you. Um, but uh, the, the larger the social distance, the less coordinated we are. And again, the point being that we are, um, in my view, in, uh, fundamentally a social species who respond to others. And so I'm, um, uh, and, and I discovered that when uh, my son was young, that, uh, that uh, children will, uh, will imitate, uh, toddlers will, will imitate you very early in life. Um, and I had a really great discussion this morning um, with um, Megan and Jacob about learning and Megan was talking, we were talking about teaching. And, you know, one of the things that I think we kind of gloss over sometimes in thinking about how, how we learn, another big question is, you know, is it, is it one of these apprentice models where we seek out an expert, uh, the expert? In other words, how much does it matter? Or is the learning like this pic old historical picture of Hazel Dickens on her porch uh, 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 playing bluegrass with, with uh, her family? Are we just surrounded by the skills that we need to learn and we're never really necessarily learning from one person that it's just part of our environment? And I think that's more of the kind of opinion that Sarah Purdy has laid out in her book, uh, Mothers and Others, which is really about alloparenting, but also gives me the feeling of, of group cooperation and group learning rather than the theoretical focus on the single person. And this is kind of, this is analogous to the influencer model because it, one model is, you know, do you learn from a single target, the best person to learn from, um, or do you learn from a group? And obviously it's gonna be context dependent. Um, in uh, one of Joe Henrik's papers from his, Field work out on uh, the Fijian Islands. They asked people um, uh, 
they asked uh, villagers on the Asawa Islands, who's the expert in yam cultivation? Who's the expert on fishing? And very often the network that they would draw out from their surveys would identify uh, one or two very clear uh, understood experts within the community. And this is how we can assume, I think we can assume most of social learning happened for uh, you know, many tens of thousands of years that we were, that human beings um, were aware, modern humans at least, were aware of who the expert is in their community or who the experts are. So we're somewhere in between these kinds of extremes, but we're not in the world that we exist today where we may have no clue who the expert is. And that's what makes me think. The other thing that makes me think is the, the fact that things seem to change what we think about, what, 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 you know, what, is, what we think about foremost in our mind might change for a lot of people quite rapidly from day to day. For others, maybe, maybe not. Um, uh, but what strikes me also, that's me from a long time ago in the upper right uh, as an archeologist at Harappa in Pakistan, one of those huge uh, uh, ancient civilizations, contemporary Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt from about 2300 BC. What struck me while I was there was that we were excavating bangles that were very similar to bangles that were worn um, in the Harappan village today, just a different uh, material. It was uh, steatite or ceramic from the past, and it was often plastics or metal in the present, but they were, it was a continuous tradition of, of, a, of a piece of material culture that you could probably stretch for 6,000 years. And then, uh, you know, uh, Dietz might want to correct me on the approximation here, but, you know, the Acheulean hand axe is another thing that, a um, uh, stone tool that at least, you know, rounding off to the nearest million years didn't change much for maybe a million years. Fairy tales, uh, my colleague, uh, Jamie Tarani, uh, analyzes uh, the folk tales in their different guises around the around Eurasia mostly. Little Red Riding Hood, uh, a story called The Smith and the Devil. He uses a uh, tree building program, a historical tree build, building algorithm or, or analysis technique known as cultural phylogenetics, which comes from regular phylogenetics and biology, to estimate the common origins of uh, different um, folk uh, tradition, folk stories that he's uh, uh, broken down into their component parts, just like almost like a genetic code, but they're, they're plotting elements. Um, and he's resolved that some of these stories are astonishingly old that were still spoken uh, in the 20th century or 19th century, still told from parents to children to parents to their children. Thousands of years old, one, uh, one story, the Smith and the Devil may be 6,000 years old. And again, so the point being that what seems to have been the norm in human culture and human history and prehistory is the passing on of culture from one generation to the next with very little change. And also, um, uh, it, you know, this is the long and deep kind of notion that, I, that I'm thinking about. They're localized and they're also very deep in terms of time. In my world, uh, I'm not gonna talk about Neolithic archeology span today, but here we have people in Central Europe for thousands of years, 5,000 BC and onward, who, you know, they might build another house on the same site a thousand years later. They persisted in the same kind of agricultural diet with and uh, livestock um, and uh, and agricultural practices and making cheese for, uh, for again for centuries, thousands of years. And in a study that I I used the isotopes for that uh, Dietz mentioned. Um, we made the case that somebody, there were the Neolithic in Europe, the first farmers of Europe were the first people to really have extensive cemeteries. And uh, people like this, this male buried on his uh, side with an with a artifact behind him known as a stone adze. We made an argument based on isotope signatures that, this, that someone in this position and with these artifacts uh, had uh, privileged access to farming land. And that has to do with a geochemical signature in his teeth that matched the, the fertile lowest soils that were, that were um, spread across this region of Central Europe. 
Um, and other people had to go much further away to herd their animals or cultivate their crops. And we argued that maybe this was the, the origin, or at least the earliest evidence that, that we've seen of intergenerational wealth transmission, if you're familiar with that subgenre of, um, of human behavioral ecology. But what is it about the 20th century? You know, there are all these traditions of human history, let's, you know, leading right up to the 19th and 20th century. And I just chose a few examples. What happens in the, in the 20th century? Well, for example, uh, the naming of children becomes something, there's a very, there's an excellent sociology study from, from East London about this. The naming of children, which had been predominantly after their parents, including girls, by the early 1930s and the mid or the mid 20th century becomes something that we just do as a fashion uh, that we you just could you just choose your own name so in 1960 the number one name almost for a girl in almost every state in the country except for the west was mary but by 2009 and and, and it's even more of a patchwork quilt now um you had you have uh different names for girls um a popularity across the country and if you go deep into the list and say Wisconsin, you might find the number one name is not even in the top 20 or 30 in California. Uh, that's something very different from just 50 years ago. And the popularity of names comes and goes. Uh, you can fit it to a nice equation there that you can see, see down there when you uh, solve for that equation. But um, it's just a, like a diffusion curve that you'll probably see all the time if you look at something trending on Twitter, except that in the case of a name, this diffusion curve occurred over decades. That's the name Christy, but Charlene, I could show you the same thing. Trisha, I show you other names. And that, that is what a fashion looks like, a slow burning fashion where the popularity rises and peaks and then falls again. But these kind of curves look the same when I look at Twitter data, they're just, they're, they just speed up, they're accelerated. Okay, so, uh, 20 years ago, uh, 15 years ago, uh, Matt Hahn, a, gen a geneticist or biologist, and I published a paper about baby names. Um, I've become in my world somewhat known for this, the baby name paper, where we argued, we, we, we said, hey, look, the, the rational choice model is, is a good model, but um, in other... How, we don't have any baseline to test what would happen if people didn't make rational choices. What if they just close their eyes and pointed to someone else and say, I'll name, what did you name your daughter? Well, I'll name my daughter the same. I choose, I'm gonna copy you. I randomly copy you. And we made an argument um, in that paper from 2003 in, in um, biology letters that there were a number of um, aggregated data patterns, including a a highly right scale distribution of popularity that you see in the upper right. That's a, that's a log log scale. Uh, the, uh, uh, that, that, that a model of this, um, uh, of, of simply randomly copying other people could capture quite well. That doesn't mean it's the only model that explains the data, but it fit. And other kinds of signatures, such as if you take the top uh, 100 names in the 1910s and you follow their mean and their variance through time, the variance grows, but the, the mean stayed roughly the same. Uh, mean popularity of the name, if you follow them through time, others are coming and going. Other things we discovered subsequently are things like turnover in, top, in the top 10 lists and so on. And the popularity, popularities of things that are so-called drifting in this way or uh, being randomly copied, just at least for an expectation. It's not, this is not a view that we have of the whole world. We were, we were misinterpreted in that way. Uh, the, the, the patterns would look like something on the left where each color is the, it's, that's one of those ribbon plots from uh, Armand Lawa's paper in Nature Human Behavior recently, um, where you can see the, the relative frequency of something is, uh, is uh, the, the, width of the color band. And you can see things come and go in popularity and one thing replaces another, all by sheer luck. There's no, the, the, we assume in this model, there's no um, intrinsic value or rational choice about anything. Things are just, uh, we're just, we're just choosing uh, by copying wh whatever choice others have made. Um, and this, so we got a lot of criticism for that paper back in 2013, but we've had more opportunity to kind of use it 
recently because this kind of random copying or at least you know rampant copying is much more common on social media than it ever was back in 2003 you know we kind of struggled to find examples uh baby names was one but even when we when we use baby names we had to we 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 were talking about the 20th century not not communities that all name their children you know a, a handful of names or the 19th century that none of that would that just falsified our model but then when Twitter comes along, we not only recognize more patterns, but we have a number of diagnostic signatures that we can use to compare to a model of random copying, some of which fit very well and others don't. And I won't go through all the subplots of this, um, of this diagram, but this is something I'm working on with Damian Ruck and others and Mike O'Brien. But one of the things that, that is very characteristic of, uh, of a, of, a more of a drift-like pattern and not, and not um, rational choice is that if you make a top 10 list of what is popular, what's the, what are the top 10 trending tweets today? And you know the answer, it's not what they were yesterday. There is constant turnover through that list. And the bigger we make the list, the more that turns over. So we make a top 100 list, there's, there's uh, uh, more turnover than there would be in a top 10 list. Uh, and it's constant. Uh, there's a constant rotation of what is the most popular thing. And it's actually quite precise the way it works out. But it's also the essence. This is kind of the essence of what I'm talking about. We've changed uh, in certain realms. We look at certain realms like Twitter where there is a constant turnover and where our attention is being drawn. And to me, it's a striking contrast with all those examples I gave you of things that were uh, you know, our attention was, or at least our partial attention was drawn to similar things for many hundreds, thousands of years. Uh, by the way, um, Armand Lua and others published a really good paper and uh, even though it was a total critique of our work because he called it neutral syndrome, it was actually a very good review of the new, of these models, random copying models. I like to call it that because it's more descriptive, but they're also known as neutral models because the choice, what if choices were neutral? Well, this group, Lua and others, um, I loved Armand. He hosted me really wonderful conference at, um, at Imperial College some years ago. And if you Google him, you'll find out a little trivia about him. He, he used to date Jerry Hall and most people who are older in the audience will know who Jerry Hall is. Um, but they kind of set us up as a straw, per, straw person in this article saying it was a syndrome. We wanted to prove that the world was neutral. No, we never did. They're just a tool in the toolkit. We've, uh, we are responding. We never, we're, we're never saying that this is the way that all the world is. We, we deliberately chose examples like baby names and now Twitter and things like that, trivial choices that we make uh, where one thing is not really necessarily more valuable than another. Uh, and, and, and we needed this as an alternative to um, rational choice. Uh, but in thinking about these kinds of conversations, I also had a conversation with Joe Henrik about this 10 years ago that made me think, of, we thought, well, there's got to be, be a way to, to make this work, to make these two different kinds of models come together in something more holistic. And since we published this paper in Behavioral and Brain Sciences, and we kind of bring it to bear in the, in the books, uh, we've been thinking a lot about a model that is oversimplified, but um, captures a lot of what we're trying to talk about. And that's a two-dimensional kind of heuristic, where you think about the decisions that people make or the behaviors that they make as being made on an individual basis versus a social learning basis. And we actually have a parameter for that and whether the payoffs for those choices are transparent or opaque. So when I talk about individual and transparent, I mean something that you would, you would definitely choose. You, know, you, you see a brand new BMW for $10, ooh, I'll take it. I don't need the, anybody's advice on that. Um, that's a great deal. Um, but when I talk about social and transparent or social, a transparent social choice, that is it more in the Joe Henrik sense where I look at an expert, I know that person to be an expert and I know that it's a good idea to learn from that person, like my piano teacher. But social and opaque, that would be something where I'm learning from someone else, but it's more like random copying or I'm just, or maybe uh, just somebody, something I, some 
some shirt I saw on the street today that comes back to me later and I decide I want to buy it. I don't even remember who was wearing it. That's what we call social and opaque or the baby names too, where there's no obvious payoff to the person, the learning from this particular person, uh, but we nonetheless learn from them anyway. That's the kind of distributed network model where you could really learn or copy from anyone um, one day to the next. And then to complete the pattern, the lower left would be individual and the, the payoff is not very well known. That would really be a random guess. So, you know, if you have no idea, you, you get a 401k and the investment person says, what stocks do you want to pick? Well, there's 50 bank stocks. Which one do you want? Uh, well, I'll take this one. Um, if, the, if the advisor gives you advice, that would probably make it the upper right. Um, but if, if the person doesn't give you advice and you just stick a pin in the newspaper, you know, where the stocks used to be listed, um, that would be just random choice. And that was that too has been uh, modeled in the past. The reason we like this, and there are other dimensions, other people have said, we got a lot of comments from this behavioral brain sciences paper, and they said, you know, that another dimension should be emotion. I agree with that. Uh, but if we keep it to two dimensions, then we, um, we have a number of patterns that we can that we would predict from the data in the different quadrants of this map. That's why we like it. Um, and we describe them you know, um, here. Uh, some of them, I've already shown some of those patterns in the lower right. I've shown um, some of those in the upper right, which is where we would put traditions. Upper left are kind of like things don't change very often or they just a reversion to the mean kind of thing. Um, and then guesswork is just a rolling the dice kind of a pattern. And we've even had a play, I don't have time to talk about that equation on the lower left, but we've even had a play at modeling the probability of making a choice, which is the key there, um, as a function of, um, of the transparency of the choice, which is beta, and the social influence, which is J. Um, more time to talk about that some other time, but we we're kind of excited about equate and 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 noise, which is that epsilon um, term there. We're kind of excited about the idea of, of of a simple kind of a process that might span this space. Alex, can Let's, I ask you a quick question there? Yeah, sure. So when you talk about the transparency or opaqueness of the choice with regard to a social choice you're inherently tying that to the transparency or opaqueness of the expertise of the model in that interaction, right? But you could imagine that even if I'm learning socially from a model, I might be basing how, you know, you could think of the transparency of my likelihood to copy as being a result of my noticing the consequences of that model's actions rather than, than that model's expertise as an individual variable, right? Like yeah. maybe he's an expert, but he's doing this clearly incorrectly. Yes, uh, yes, Chad. And um, I know your name because your name comes up and we uh, there was an introduction in the beginning. Um, yes, and this is why what we want to do with this in the future is make this is, is, is um, try to envision this as a continuous space rather than a four quadrant space. Because what you just said is something I would think of as sort of in the in-between land. But um, maybe, uh, um, and I, I fully agree with you. And it's, it's also one of the, you know, the, it, it's just one of the hangups of, of trying to reduce, um, you know, do, do a dimension reduction like we're doing here and think of things in this way. But we do want it to become a continuous space. And let me give a couple of examples in, of, of thinking in this way, for example, diet. And it, it, just to give an example of the kind of uh, thinking and then the nuances, yes, do cause complications. But with diet, we know that for, for a lot of people, um, you know, what they eat is a, is a function of their, you know, one component of it. The other way to think of this is, there are layers of our behavior, you know, at one level, at one broad level, we need to satisfy our nutritional needs, food must be available, and it's got to be affordable. And that that's available and nutritional needs counts, whether you're hunting and gathering or horticulture, or you're shopping, uh, you know, within a food desert. Um, but, um, and, so, and, and so, 
another aspect though of human diet is that especially as an archaeolo archaeologist will appreciate just how traditional diet is that's an ancient cheese strainer there shown in the upper right from uh, 6,000 years ago or 7,000 years ago from the Richard Evershed's group at uh, Bristol University but there are so many examples of food ways um, and traditional diet that and subsistence practices that lasted for uh, many, many generations, hundreds of years. And down in the lower right, that's an avocado spread. Uh, I just learned about that last year. You know, it's good to take some uh, rough bread and spread avocado on it. So it's, it's a great uh, snack. And, you know, there's good cholesterol. I grew up when avocados are like, you, you, don't, um, you don't go anywhere near avocados or any kind of fat. Um, and, and again, it strikes me that um, I'm not learning from my parents to eat avocado toast or from, my, from a cultural tradition that I was brought up in. I'm just learning from other people. Um, and they could be anywhere. Um, well, you know, they're the kind of people like avocado toast. But um, the fact that we live in, a, in an era with diet fashions is something I also as an archaeologist, part-time archaeologist, see as remarkable. Okay, so that brings me to my case study in obesity. Um, obesity kind of envelops uh, these several layers of what's going on. Uh, when you map things like life expectancy or obesity or diabetes or heart conditions or, or um, income or the reverse of income, you know, the same kinds of uh, of unfortunate patterns come up in the US that the worst areas are the, the Mississippi Delta, the Appalachians, uh, Native American reservations. And there's a consistent geography um, to ill um, chronic uh, conditions in the United States. But one of the questions, so one of the questions we talked about here, and I'm talking now about the kind of upper left quadrant of uh, availability and affordability is why has uh, obesity in the United States risen so dramatically since 1990. Uh, it really is, it really has been the, the dramatic rise, a tripling of obesity rates across the country has occurred mostly in the last 30 years. Um, and those are a couple of individual states there and then maps from 1990s to the 2000s. And um, this is also puzzling because uh, for evolutionary human behavioral ecologists like Dan Hrushker, um, uh, at uh, Arizona State University and his colleagues, you know, they look at, they've looked at um, different data from developing countries and uh, body mass index of, of people. And, and generally speaking, up to a certain level of wealth, the more wealth you have the, the, uh, in these in poorer countries, the more you have, the more you are able to eat. So your so body mass tends to go up with income or wealth, depending on how it's measured, or even with GDP per capita, which is a pretty rough nation level measure. But in the United States, before 1990, this was something we discovered in this paper, there was no, there was not, not much of a relationship at all between in the uh, household, median household income in US counties and the, the rate of obesity in those counties. That's the blue line there at the bottom. That's as far back as we could get data for it. Uh, but by, by 2015, there was a very sharp inverse gradient between income and obesity. And the, the different theories about this are that it's, you know, it, it's expensive to be able to exercise. There are food deserts and that cheap, the cheapest food is the worst for you. Um, and we, we characterized how that, that income gradient grew over time. It grows gradually over those 25 years from the 1990, uh, not statistically significant, um, to a very sharp inverse gradient in 2015. And I've been, in reading the literature, I've been, become convinced that um, sugar may play a role. Uh, refi but, but um, and I did a little qualitative research into this in addition to reading some uh, material in, in the public health um, literature. But um, the, the, the sugar, the, the the, there was a change in how sugar was marketed to children in the 1960s. Uh, Fruit Loops marshmallow is a cereal that I didn't eat when I was a kid. My mom wouldn't let me, but it still has, it's half sugar by weight. 
And I did some digging in the archives of, of a do document trove at University of Sa uh, San Francisco, California, San Francisco, and came across things like um, this memo from the Sugar Association from 1978, where the, uh, the, the board member was at a meeting, a government uh, a meeting, where they were talking about assuring that food is available at reasonable costs, um, uh, safe and high quality and affordable, pretty reasonable. Um, but this, and notice that the association is on K Street. The memo for the, for the Sugar Association concludes that they must uh, oppose these measures with all their might before it goes into a position of public acceptance and permanence. And they were talking about that food becomes safe and affordable and, and nutritional, uh, nutritional. But the, the problem was when we were, just, um, Hillary Fouts and Damien Ruck and I, when we were discussing, well, um, and we had other correspondences, the rise of high fructose corn syrup in foods in the 70s, but we thought, well, okay, if we, if we believe the other literature that sugar is really a driver of obesity and, um, and diabetes, that's, that there's a segment of the literature that argues that, um, why would there be such a, why would these changes have happened in the 70s and 80s and then obesity not, um, not come into the record until the 1990s and then uh, proceed to increase from there? And the way we modeled it was that, well, actually it's an adult obesity rate. So those children who were raised on excess sugar, like me, um, like I was in the 70s and 80s, um, they do two things. They enter the, they enter the adult record later, uh, you know, once they're 18. So there, there would be a delay in that sense, but also they inherit, they, they move from one cohort to the next as time goes along and sugar goes up. Sugar, the sugar calories per day rose until just about 2000, the year 2000, and it has been declining since then. But why have we not seen a, why have we not seen a decline in obesity since 2000? It may have just turned over a few years ago. And started declining because uh, people like me who were raised in the 80s and 90s uh, were uh, inherited, so to speak, our habits from the previous from our cohort. We follow our cohort through time, and that includes dietary habits and an accumulation of excess weight over time. That's how we modeled it. Um, and so what we what we thought we did well. And explain the blue lines there show the model, and the red dots and the bar in the age profile there. One is the change in overall obesity in the United States over time. The other is across the different age groups at the year 2015 when our model, when we ran our model. Um, we argued that this was one way to explain the time delay between the, the, the uh, uh, huge increase in empty calories in the United States public uh, diet. And, um, and the, the delayed onset of, uh, of increased obesity. Okay, one other example kind of timely is uh, COVID-19. Uh, so th the, 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 the previous example was um, an example of, of thinking through the change in obesity sort of as a, as a overlapping overlap of a couple of quadrants in this way that we like to think about decision-making. Some are baked in, and some are some some are uh, habits that you in, inherit from your childhood. Uh, but here's another one. We all know that uh, the, w there's a battle going on between health information and uh, behaviors that would mitigate the spread of COVID-19, like wearing masks. And we were interested in whether cultural values at the national scale have any impact on on the death rate of COVID-19. And what we've done here and I'm compressing a lot here in this slide, but we're, we're using uh, values from the World Value Survey that Damien Rupp collected uh, for his PhD thesis several years ago. Um, and he, he basically took, it's a, it's a survey conducted in native languages around the world in 80 countries or more, uh, 300 questions, which we reduced through principal component analysis and, and the factor analysis into several factors uh, and I just show the references below because I don't have time to talk about that. But one of the factors, um, and it's not surprising because the survey was generated to cover different parts of culture. So they're pretty, they're, they're similar to the, the organization of the survey itself. 
One of them is something we call cosmopolitanism, which is the willingness for people to tolerate uh, people who are not like them or, or, um, or uh, not of their ethnicity or foreigners. Um, and we found that that variable, as you can see in the lower right, actually correlates with higher deaths per capita. That cultural value is resolved at the nation level. Um, and we argue that um, that has to, that unfortunately a willingness to uh, mix more freely, that's one of the things that spreads COVID. Um, obesity was a very, is a well-known um, risk factor and that came out in our multivariate regression um, as, a, as a serious um, uh, factor in, uh, in predicting death rates over time. And again, there's a lot of devil in the details in this paper. Um, but the other, the one factor that mitigated against that, that tend to correlate with lower um, deaths per capita was um, a, a, a combination of a, a variable uh, that included variables that, that, that we use to, to uh, cover government efficiency. There's a data set on government efficiency in, in these 80 nations. And then one of the cultural values of institutional confidence. And we use that as a, we did the regressions with them separate, but when we put them together, we, we reasoned that these two things are so hand in hand. And it's essentially describes at a very coarse level, the ability for a government to um, install different kinds of mitigation measures. And that, that had a modest effect in reducing the um, number of deaths by COVID. The, but so the point being that there is some kind of information in even ag highly aggregated uh, uh, cultural values um, from, from the World Values Survey in, in some kind of a health outcome. And those are deep seated, for the most part, those are deep seated values um, that, um, that, that are perpetuated through generations. But there's, you know, so another thing that you can inherit, and, and maybe this is cheating a little bit to call it social and, and transparent, but it's, um, by, but what we mean by this is something that you also inherit from your parents. You don't learn it, but you inherit it just the same. Are, are you know, a lot of structural disadvantages, wealth inequality, or you're born in a, a, a poor part of the country or, or a disadvantaged ethnic group. And this is the map of uh, COVID-19 from, from the summer. And you can see um, other than New York, um, some of the same areas are affected that were, um, that were disadvantaged in other maps, but this isn't exactly equal. But we did an analysis of the of, at county level data, um, this time looking at structural, uh, all, the, all the socioeconomic variables we could think of to put into our regression. Uh, so there's 3,000 counties roughly in the United States that you can get these kind of data for. Uh, some of them have missing data, but most of them do. Everything from number of ICU beds in the hospital to obesity levels, income, uh, the traditional census uh, ethnicities of black, Hispanic, native or Pacific origin and, and white, uh, diabetes levels, number of people over, six, per, uh, percentage of people over 65, uh, education, pollution levels, everything we could think of. Um, and when we did a, an un, a kind of a, it's not machine learning, I'm not supposed to say machine learning, but it's an unstructured, uh, unsupervised way of running the regression where we, we essentially try to coalesce um, all of the variation in as few, um, few variables as possible. It's called a lasso regression. Um, and this, by the way, for you, that do a lot of regressions, this was a negative binomial regression because these variables are not normally distributed. But um, we found what came out of the, the most important factors in predicting COVID death rates in the United States were uh, population size, population density, public transport, vote share, the difference between Republican and, and Democratic voting, where vote positive means more Democrat, and percent African American in the um, in the county uh, as a percent of the population. This does not mean that those five factors are the causes of death by COVID. I wanna stress that, but they are the most predictive. And that, that's probably because being um, in, in uh, like for example, um, percent African-American encompasses a lot of other risk factors as part of that variable, diabetes, um, hypertension, and um, of, of elevated obesity, for example, and, and income being lower. 
uh, public transport contains other aspects of population crowding, which is conducive to the spread of COVID. Uh, but so uh, these are, uh, these, uh, many of these are structural variables that we don't make decisions about. They just exist where, where we are born. And finally, with COVID, there is the aspect, there is another layer, which is the copying of ideas. And um, there's not, there's, um, you know, the, the idea of not wearing a mask is, is something that a lot of people do as, a, as, you know, you go to the supermarket, are people wearing masks or are they not? How, how much does that influence you, seeing people who are wearing, wearing masks and not? On our campus at UT, everyone wears a mask. And so that's, that, that helps uh, ensure that we all wear masks because we all see the other people doing it. And um, just, to, just to relate back to a, a study we did from 10 years ago of the swine flu uh, in 2009, we didn't have these kind of data back then, but we just showed that, that um, I'm calling it fake news. That's a little strong. I didn't mean that. Um, uh, I meant swine flu there, but that that people were so worried about swine flu around the world, and I, I don't mean fake news because it wasn't fake news in those many of those uh, in countries in, in East Asia and, and Southeast Asia, but the way it the the concern about it spread, as measured by Google Trends, uh, Google searches, is just like one of those fashion curves of other people. People looking to others and and um, uh, and and panic or concern spreading as a form of social diffusion, as opposed to I am concerned about my health. I'm going and I've heard from you know I have this information about the risks of H1N1 and I'm going to go look it up. Um, no, I, I heard from someone else that it's scary. So this leads me to my last couple of slides, and I I know I've I've glossed over a lot of things here. Um, and there's going to be, you know, yeah, it's, it, but it leads us to a way of thinking about w one thing that I wanted to take away from all this or leave you with is that a lot of the trend, the, the changes that I showed you, some of which are, uh, you know, uh, resilient, the, the, the structural, the geographic inequalities that we have in the United States, for example. Um, stay with us. They 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 don't they don't change very fast. In fact, sugar. You know, if you look at the history of sugar, it's hundreds of years of of just absolute destruction, um, including the slave trade as a major driver of that. So the some things don't change. Some things do change very quickly, and um, and a lot of these problems that bedevil us may be different layers of things that are changing quickly versus things that um, are remaining the same. And if we can disentangle them in our data analysis, that might help in the way that we um, intervene in some of these things. And I'll close on saying the one thing I didn't talk about today that worries me is that now we have something else to worry about. I was just talking about the human cap capacity to copy or to learn from the parents or to make a, a rational choice. But what happens when our decisions or what we pay attention to are promoted through algorithms that may uh, promote things that never should have mattered to us in the past, which is recency that, uh, well, okay, maybe you know, there's a fire. Okay, it's recent, I, I better respond to it. But a lot of the, the traditional behaviors that was, is the exact opposite. They were very ancient kinds of traditions and popularity in and of itself. And I think this is very worrying because of the way that we learn and the way that wisdom is perpetuated over, adaptive learning takes place over generations and is vetted by the time, the, the, the process. Um, and it's not popularity that um, should matter so much. And I, I think that worries me about the evolution of, of uh, you know, from ancestors to algorithms. That's the reason why that subtitle was there. It's the, it's the, the medium um, that matters to coin the old phrase. Okay, so um, I, uh, I, I wanna thank some of the people there. Josh uh, uh, Borst, um, who is now at Vanderbilt University, Damien Ruck, was with me until just a couple of months ago. He's now at the Lazare Lab at, at Northeastern University, and my colleagues at the in the College of Communication and Journalism at, at UT: Susie Allard, Natalie Rice, Catherine Luther, and uh, Ben Horn. Thank you very much.
Thank you. <laughs> Alex. So, yeah, yeah, sorry. We, we do have time for, for, for questions. And I think we'll proceed in the, uh, the ideal version where you just sort of speak into a silence. If we start getting jammed up, we might have to, to go with uh, putting questions into the chat. Um, but for now, I think we can probably keep it more naturalistic, uh, hopefully. Uh, so please go ahead. Can I, may I? Philippe. Yeah. Hey, Alex. Uh, thank you very much. Well, really interesting. There's a lot into your presentation. Uh, I, you know, I, I was uh, expecting to get a better hang on what uh, cultural acceleration might be. Uh, so uh, how how would you define, I mean, how do you, do you have an, some kind of an operational definition of, uh, of acceleration? Because somehow you, you, you talk about waves and yeah. you, you talk about things that became, they remain stagnant, that are kind of random, that are emerging and disappearing. But there, is, there are some parameters that really capture something that is indeed accelerating. I mean, you know, you get the speed of information exchange and stuff like that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, could so, you express it more? Yeah, in a, in a nutshell, the, the, we've gone from uh, an existence where, you know, I don't think that a Neolithic person would even be conscious of change in their lifestyle. Uh, somebody who lived 5,000 years ago and farmed lentils and peas and herded their goats day after day, and so did their children. And they, you know, they replastered the walls of their house. Um, that's what they did. And I wonder sometimes how people didn't get extremely bored. Folk tales. But then, what? Then we get into the realm where things do change, and uh, they go from more uh, narrow and deep to shorter and broader. And we start to see those kinds of uh, diffusion chain uh, uh, waves. Uh, become uh, faster and faster. So uh, the names in the 20th century changed in popularity over decades. Um, you know, as we all know now, things change um, in the news cycle. You know, from morning to daytime, and and things in between. And and so my uh, my definition of cultural change um, accelerating is not highly uh, intricate. But the reason why is the reason why the things we talk about, the things that constitute, that, that fill up our, our attention span change so fast. I think we can learn a lot about the changing of the dimensions of our learning from uh, broad and, and, and uh, sorry, from uh, long and narrow to broad and shallow and more and more shallow. And the more and more it becomes uh, focused on popularity for in and as in and of itself, the more it becomes like random, uh, it takes on a dynamic of random copying or, or random drift where there really is no directionality to it. So there's both, a, you know, the, the, the acceleration is one of the acceleration of loss of, I think loss of information, loss of wisdom, loss of knowledge potentially. Um, and the, the, the acceleration of turnover in terms of what is it that we're focused on at, at, you know, what are the top five things that we're focused on from one moment to the next? Um, that would be my, um, that would be my definition. Um, yeah, I, I, I could, I could just follow up on, uh, what, uh, you and Philippe were just, uh, discussing, uh, about the rate of culture change. And I, I just wonder if there is, yeah, I, I think, uh, um, you know, it, it's hard to think uh, that there isn't a big difference between the pace of change, say, in the Neolithic and now and, you know, in any dimension. And right. it seems so intuitively obvious that, it, you know, it has to be true. But I do wonder if we're also doing a little bit of apples and oranges, uh, comparing this pace of change on something like social media to the pace of change of things that we can actually observe in the archaeological record, which would be uh, technologies and material goods and that sort of thing. Oh, and no, I just I wonder if there's a recovery bias that we have, that the things that we know about in the past are the ones that lasted a long time. Yeah, and yeah. You know, the, the comparison with Twitter might be with the gossip in the village, which we don't know about, but probably changed 
Yeah, well, Dietz, I, I, I sort of disagree because, uh, you know, if you work on GitHub, what are you doing? That's your, it's, not a, it's not a stone tool, but it's a tool, and you can copy your code from anyone. And look at academic publishing. Um, the, uh, there, there's, 5, 000, there's about 7,000 papers on COVID now published on MedArchive. It's too much for anyone to read. But a lot of, uh, you know, we're, the, a lot of the content of those papers is borrowed from previous papers. And so, yeah, I am, I am, I, I do, I do think of stone tools as being the same as a paper on COVID in the sense that it's, their are their ideas, you know, written out in some material medium. Uh, there's a, there's a bow plan for a stone tool, although I don't know if there is, because I know, the, but there, there is some sort of a recipe and there's also, you know, a code on GitHub or a scientific paper or any, or some blog, that's also a series of steps. And yeah. so I don't see, yeah, I, th I think of them as uh, more like apples and maybe uh, granny apples. Well, uh, yeah, so you, yeah, not or, to you know, predominate, but yeah, I see, I mean, I totally, you're preaching to the, the choir if you try to talk about the similarity between, uh, you know, the technologies and, and even language and other sorts of symbolic representation. And, yeah. uh, but I, I guess maybe it's not apples and oranges, but it's like uh, all of the apples versus just a few of the apples, you know, in terms of what we can recover. And like any, you know, so they didn't have a technology that were oh, I record see. something ah. like what's on GitHub. So we don't know about it, right? Ah. Uh, you know, they, so a lot of the variation is lost in the dirt. Yes, it's uh, okay. Minus, right? Yes, okay, well, I can't, I, yeah, I think you're right. And we know that the further back you go, uh, the less, the, the, the less you see in the past. Um, uh you ended up on a note where you shared with us something that we probably agree with, being very concerned about the algorithms. It doesn't seem that you have a way of getting rid of them. All the work of a few decades that you've done, would you consider working on an alternative algorithm? Um, I just, I think that the I don't know how to get through to the people who pull the levers, but I think the um, the and the 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 little graphic I gave for the Facebook algorithm is oversimplified now, but it still is fundamentally, you know, the the the, the metrics that drive it are, uh, uh, you know, come down to popularity and uh, uh, and recency. More, uh, more now it has to do with content. But if I were like arguing on Congress, you know, on, on Capitol Hill, I would say we just need these algorithms to be fo to, to be focused more on um, content, you know, and, and uh, truth and if we can define it, but not on merely what is popular and, and recent. I think that's extraordinarily dangerous. And I think that's actually at the root of all of this sorting and echo chambering. Um, I mean, that's kind of a strong statement and maybe I didn't mean to make it so strongly, but I, I think those two, the, the, these true arbitrary rules or ways of, of bringing things to our attention that make money uh, are, are very dangerous because they're so, they're, they're so counter to the way that we learned as a human species. Uh, so I, I come at this from more of an engineering perspective. Um, and I've been recently very interested in this idea of transitioning through these spaces um, yeah, sorry, I just came back from a, a run, so I was a bit um, there. So this, this whole notion of um, engineering um, ways through which we can mitigate some of these issues that we find, um, you know, things like, you know, the food that we eat. Um, it's very interesting that in many places of the world, um, even without all this mechanized agriculture, um, good quality food remains still very inexpensive. So it seems to be the case that um, different cultures have engineered their societies to, you know, to, to provide things like agency and knowledge to individuals in different circumstances. Certainly, we would like for some of the most important decisions that we make uh, to be had with adequate choice and adequate knowledge of what the various ramifications of any decision uh, would be. So it seems as though populations exist within this dimension that you've constructed. 
and transition through this uh, dimensional space using um, you know, qualities like individual agency to make change and uh, the capacity to uh, observe from experts and people who know uh, what the best decisions uh, would be in a given situation and that we just strive to uh, construct means through which um, you know, we can transition from this uh, very centralized, you know, Twitter ask here's, you know, the suggested feed uh, to uh, a domain of information um, availability, uh, intercultural exchange, interpersonal, um, you know, communication that facilitates um, acquiring optimal uh, knowledge about what is important in the day, um, as well as the capacity to use that knowledge to make changes that are important to you know, the concerns that people have. Yeah, and so this is where I think it's uh, this, what I've, the talk I've given is really the start of a dialogue with an engineer like you. You know, so I can say to you, it, we, we would sit down and, and you're thinking about, um, you're, you're thinking about some of these algorithms and then I can come and sit down and, with you and say, look, can we, can, we, um, can we at least, let's just say we had the power to, to change. We, we, we had our own platform, that, you know, some new platform. And we say, okay, we're gonna make a good social media platform. And then I would say to you as a member of your team, just do anything but make popularity your main metric. You know, can you, can you, how are we going to direct people to other people and to, um, and to information that helps them. And what are the risks when the information and the people that they are going to are not from the same community that all, you know, many generations of their ancestors went to? Not to say that it's wrong, but we, we wanna think about that as opposed to just moving to Silicon Valley 15 years ago and just making a company and just doing what works for. And that, so yeah, I don't propose to have all the answers as much as I, I have a, I propose to have a better entryway to a, a, a conversation that would lead to a process that, that gets people, um, that gets people there quicker. And I, you know, I, I almost feel like, you know, with a subject like this, you're almost out of date as soon as you say it, because, you know, it is getting to the point now where we kind of navigate algorithms that, that are, uh, based on a lot more of our personal information. I recognize that. I, I won't say that I ever watch movies on Netflix, but I do. And I, the way I get to the ones I like, I, I sort of work with the algorithm who's kind of getting to know me. And, you know, and I, I actually now have no clue over the balance of popularity and my qualities and, and uh, you know, recency that, that go into how it helps me find what I'm finding. But I'm particularly, I'm particularly interested in how this relates to how we find scientific literature as a, as a niche. What if there was a paper from 1976 that would change what you're doing for your, you know, your research? How on earth are you gonna find it? Um, okay, that was a long answer, sorry. Great question. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I mean, the potential is really there and um, <laughs> You know, it's a great thing about language that we can actually um, build this symbolic uh, representation of that which is important to us and modern computing, which allows us to navigate that information space. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's some, um, we're talking about differential, um, like community spread algorithms um, that facilitate this kind of um, interpersonal um, decision-making or inter-identity formation. Um, and yeah, so there's a, there's a burgeoning literature um, of that regard, as well as a number of software platforms that are aiming to facilitate um, this kind of, um, I guess, what, Web 3.0 um, or the next phase of human yeah. uh, communication um, that is digitized. Um, so yeah, yeah, I would love to yeah. talk more about that. And in short, I would say one of the things I found out, you know, working with advertisers and marketers is they so often focus on content, which is great. But I knew all this stuff from cultural evolution about the process, regardless of content, you know, and how do we want to look at the, the process of learning, not just um, what we favor that, 
um, as a matter of content. So you can see that if I say, can you just favor, turn down the knob on you know, popularity and not so recent, that, that's, that's value neutral in terms of the content. I'm just saying, I, th I think things will be better if you turn those knobs down. So we had a uh, question in the chat from Chris Martin. What are you, Chris Lee, all right. <laughs> all right, uh, anybody else? Uh, I actually have a question, which is related to the research line of random copying or cultural drift. Yeah. Um, is it possible that the, at individual level? Oh, okay. Just sorry. What? I heard you. At individual level, um, agents are still like subject to like uh, various like content-based or context-based like prestige or success bias, but these signals are wiped out at population level. Have you like conducted yes. similarly like? Um, at different like scales, like at states, country, or like counties, like uh, how would it change the results? Uh, Chang, you are exactly right. That's an assumption we've we've a convenient assumption we've made that we like to make that that all these different biases kind of cancel each other out, and it 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 is at this scale of analysis as if people were copying randomly. Let's say we zoom in. Let's say I was looking at state level, and I zoom into county or community level. I might get to a community where um, you know lots of people have the same name, and suddenly my model is falsified, even though it was kind of working at the state level. But I get into a just a, a, a small um, uh, com community where uh, lots of boys are, have the same name or similar names, and suddenly it doesn't look like random copying anymore. And so one of the things that has been proposed is using this kind of model as a baseline for resolving the boundaries in the data of communities as w when that model becomes falsified. So you're absolutely right. It is scale dependent. Uh, could I ask a question, please? Um, yeah. I, I, I didn't hear you say too much about cumulative cultural change. And I wondered if you might talk about that a little but it, it seems to me that a lot of that change has been functional and, and non-arbitrary and that there have been a lot of uh, improvements in technology and that you know the, the pace at which that is happening has accelerated. I, I mean, would you agree with that? Yes, and I didn't use it just because I thought, um, yeah, I, I love the literature on cumulative culture change and I won't mention, uh, I guess I have to mention him again, Joe Henrik, who I think was at Emory when he published that 2004 paper. But um, that all those traditions that I was showing, I, I consider as cumulative cultural change and Moore's law with computers and all these things. And um, so what I'm concerned about are, is the social learning and the, you know, the Twitter sphere. Um, so imagine if, if we just, you know, if we, we took everything we knew about a particular technology and just forgot it all tomorrow and just started over with something else, you know, it doesn't work. And I, so yeah, I'm fundamentally concerned about cumulative culture change or cumulative technology, the progress in technology. If we, if we, if our, uh, you know, if our, uh, our horizon, our depth of knowledge retreats and, uh, and become shallower. And that's why I'm concerned about scientific literature. There has been a, a, a bibliographies of papers published in science or wherever they're published have become more recent late, late, lately. There's a study by James Evans, you know, the average age of the, um, and um, it worries me, you know, just because somebody published in 2001, uh, is that knowledge not important anymore? Or has it are we assuming that it's all been brought to the fore and all of that knowledge is now contained in every paper from 2018 that we don't need to look back? Well, also, that concerns me. I'm sure this is obvious, but it also mm -hmm. speaks to the value of the sort of elderly people in society and how that yes. may be yes. diminishing. And uh, I think that's a big concern too. So when Joe and Jacob and, I, and Megan and I were talking about this, when Joe published that paper, I thought that's great population size as you know, like the container in which knowledge exists, but also age. Because if you add 10, 10 years to people's lives, there's 10 more years 
times all those people for for you know little boxes of knowledge if i kind of think of it as a rectangle and also the older you get the wiser you get and also the less violent you get you know um, and i've often thought about if we could know what average ages were in these deep archaeological times what would what kind of adaptive effect would it have um, i know that, well there's the grandmother effect there's a there's a theory about that but not on the male side or the or the cumulative culture side that's a great question so um if i if i can sort of rehash what i was talking about earlier when i asked you the question alex so i'm really interested in the question of social learning and how it interacts with cultural transmission in animals um, and in pre-linguistic humans maybe. And so I think of a lot of different and potentially separate processes that allow for something like social learning to happen. You might be, um, the transmission of information across individuals might be facilitated by, you know, um, just general social, um, reward it might be facilitated by the attribution of expertise to an individual and so that individual's actions are more likely to copy it might be related to the salience of the value of the outcome of what that individual did regardless of who that individual is um, there are even for example some studies in uh, crows recently that are showing maybe the way they transmit um, their tool making, the pandanus leaf tool making techniques is artifact mediated. So they don't actually potentially interact with each other at all to do it. They just use tools left behind by other crows successfully. And so uh, whenever we switch to talking about humans doing culture in, a, in the context of language, I feel like we collapse all of the different dimensions along which the value of social learning happens into one dimension but presumably humans have access to all of these at the same time so i might be valuing the copying of a behavior along cultural lines but i also might be doing it along adherence to authority or expertise but i also might be evaluating it individually on its outcome basis and it seems to me like pretend at least given that some animals seem to be doing some subset of these and not others, that there are to some degree separable processes. And so do you not think that, do you, do you still see that there's what we can talk about here is sort of the added total of all of the ways that I might evaluate which actions to copy and which not to copy? Or do you really think that once we've gotten to modern linguistic humans, we're really just talking about, um, you know, about about a dimensionality reduction that actually happens in the in the transmission rather than in the way we reconstruct it. Um, well, I often think of this kind of heuristic space in terms of animal social learning, for one thing. Um, <clears throat> I don't see much difference between the the way that I read a paper um, about. Uh, herding and the way that uh, uh, baboons will move to a new uh, resource spot, and it's a function of the 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 kind of directionality or intensity of the the in, the first individuals to move, and the number of individuals who are following them. And there's other work by Ian Cousin of Princeton, and that um, you know argue that 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 whether you have a kind of pied piper effect of people following a leader is a function of the intensity of the um, of that action combined with uh, with the numbers of people following and i see those two dimensions and and uh, sorry this and i see those dimensions as especially the in, the intensity as being analogous to the transparency axis and actually mathematically it's pretty much equivalent. And economists call it intensity of choice. And in Brexit, there was observed that the Brexit side had more intensity of choice. So um, <clears throat> um, I, I, I see a lot of uh, overlap between the, uh, and, uh, and, and a lot of our faith in this kind of heuristic is actually based on uh, stuff that we learned in, um, in, in, in animal learning. 
The only thing I think that anthropologists and cultural evolutionists argue that is exceptional about humans is the cumulative culture. Uh, and, but the, and, and the strong propensity, uh, I guess the thing about language is that you have such a strong propensity to learn it from your parents. Um, but I don't, the, I, I certainly don't see a, um, a, like a sense of human exceptionalism here. Megan and I were talking the, today in my discussion at lunchtime about how she, she witnessed a uh, misbehavior spread through a class of, of preschoolers or toddlers. And it reminded me of Ian Cousin talking about panic spreading through a herd of um, herding animals. I forgot what they were, sorry. Um, so yeah, I do see a lot of parallels here. I think I kind of only tangentially answered your question. Um, do you want to ask a part of it again? Um, I, well, maybe I can just hope to clarify, but if this is sort of tangential to what you're hoping to talk about, I don't think we need to linger. I just think that when we think about humans, I think there are a lot of different heuristics that must coexist and sort of fight against each other for, oh. for, for a decision to be made. Like I might make the authority decision. I might make the yes. outcome salience decision. I might make the object preference decision. Um, and all of those things presumably are fighting at the same time, aren't they? Yeah, okay, I agree with you. And this goes back to Cheng's question about scale of analysis. So we know, we know there's lots of reasons why people name their children. You know, it sounds good, it's, somebody, it's a famous person, a million reasons. But at a certain scale of analysis, it's, a, it's the sort of gambit that economists used to use about rational choice. The, the, uh, the patterns of popularity behave as if people were copying randomly. Now, I think there's more evidence at the, on social media that sometimes we are actually copying randomly. But it's a little bit of a, you know, it, it's saying that at a certain population scale, there's not a resolvable difference between the options that would make, uh, you know, a significant portion of the of the group choose that option, you know, because it has better cost benefit. They all have their in. There's so many idiosyncratic reasons out there that we're just going to sum it up in this error term. Well, That's well, the best example. That's probably an unsatisfying answer, but I I really love population scale, or uh, you know, aggregated scale data, and that you know that's that is. When we get down to an individual, and um, you know, the bets are kind of off. Did I make this decision randomly? We don't go there very often, I'm afraid. Um, Philippe, you were going to say something. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, there's the issue of conformity, and uh, conformity you can look at the population level, yes. but at, at a level of. Uh, at an individual level, from a developmental perspective, uh, it's really around three years that uh, kids start to engage in what we call strong conformity. Uh, yes. So, so yeah. Philippe, I want to say we add a, we do add things like conformity bias to this neutral model. We we see it as like a just a starting point at the other end from rational choice. Now let's build in conformity bias or anti-conformity bias or other kinds of biases, maybe even prestige bias where you're more likely to copy somebody who's been already being copied a lot, that kind of thing. One of the things that conformity does is, is it slows the turnover. If everybody's copying one person and they've all determined that that one person is who we're gonna copy, it reduces the noise in, in that person's, that, that behavior's popularity. Um, and so the choice of that person remains number one longer than it would under the null, the null model of, of neutral copying. Um, even, you know, for whatever reason, it's the most popular choice. If we're all, you know, under perfect conformity, then nothing changes until that person changes his or her choice. So, um, then, yeah. That's why we like so many dimensions of the data, including doing things like ranking things in the top 10 and looking at how much turnover there's been and, and things like that. The dynamics tell you a lot about what, uh, give you a little more hint about what's going on, at least at the population scale. 
But there's a natural turnover that we call, the, for example, revolution. I mean, you, you know, ah, you have, yeah, like, okay. you have a, a crisis yeah. and uh, yeah. I mean, that's how historians see things, right? Uh, and that's, uh, yes, and that's, I would argue that's fairly non-random, it's directional. And it yeah. looks different than, um, than just the kind of, uh, you know, drift that goes on day to day on Twitter, for example. I, I, if I can, uh, I have a, a little bit of a, a concern about uh, the using the terms uh, choice and social learning sort of interchangeably. And I know that this comes out of uh, uh, sort of this idea of talking about social learning as being about copying and transmission. Um, but I just wonder if it's not really quite the same thing to talk about being presented with a range of options and, and choosing one versus uh, you know, developing, for instance, a skill uh, or learning how to do something. Um, you know, I, I can't decide that you know, I've run into you and I'd really like to uh, copy your knowledge of uh, computational and statistical uh, analysis, right? That right. it doesn't happen that way. And, but so, and I mean, when we talk about people like choosing something and turnover and stuff that happens on social media, I get the point that you made about uh, you know uh, discovering the right scientific articles and losing knowledge in that way, but still that's sort of a, a choice and uh, you know and a finding things thing, and it's not quite the same as when you talk about cumulative culture, which is all about these building these more and more complicated processes and skills that ultimately are going to take a, you know you know an apprenticeship or a learning process to acquire. And it seems like you can't quite model that the same way you would a series of choices. Uh, well, you've given me something I'll have to think about over dinner. So I don't pretend that I'm answering your question entirely here because that's a very good question. But I think of that heuristic as how, how do I learn every day and every day? So who do I learn from today? Oh, my mom. Who do I learn from the next day? My mom, you know, every day. But who do I learn from on Twitter? I don't know, some bot. Who do I learn from tomorrow? Somebody else. And so I take that. Um, so I, I, I would say that you, so you apply this model every single iteration of, of uh, so social learning is just like a snapshot of many of these four boxes stacked up on, and you're mostly in that uh, upper right. You're learning from the same person, your piano teacher every day. Uh, but thank you for a very good question. I'll think about that over sustenance um, of some sort. I really wish we were having you to dinner <laughs> so that we could <laughs> talk about it. Unfortunately, we've reached 5.30. I don't know if there's any last questions, people. Thank you, Alex. It was great, really. Oh, fun. thank you. I enjoyed it. I want to say I really enjoyed my conversations today. Um, it was really fun. Come see yeah. us. And, yes. uh, yeah, I will. Thank you. Yeah, we're just over the mountain, so any yeah. of you want to come up here? Thank you all. Thank you. Bye.